I first heard about my new my next guest in 1999 on the album As the World Burns, uh, Alpha Matador Records. Uh, the deba- it was the debut album of the group The Arsonists. I, of course, rocked his album on my college radio show. This MC has grown in his career since 1999, wearing many hats from MC to DJ to voiceover work to radio host. He's destroyed. I want to welcome him to the library. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for welcoming me to the library. Sorry we'll be talking, po- yeah. possibly loud, so <laughs> any library teachers, we're sorry. We're sorry. <laughs> my mom's a librarian, so she'll, there she'll, you go. she'll, be forgi- she'll forgive me for this. That um, works. So I was going to start. Prior to... To Lost in Fire, which was released this year, uh, the newest, which was the newest Arsonist right. album. Uh, the last release was 2001. Um, just what happened that made Date of Birth look like would be the final album? Uh, what happened was uh, we're in retrospect now. You know, we're yeah. after the fact and all yeah. the stories have been told, uh, at least privately. You know, and now um, I created an opportunity where I was able to re-release the album, which people can go ahead and get the As the World Burns, which was never available online uh, for streaming or anything. So that's available. And then the Lost in the Fire, which was kind of a uh, songs that were created throughout the time. And then later on, um, that that's what that is. As far as the arsonist and its collapse, the group's collapse. Uh, we toured. We toured a lot, and when you tour with a lot of individuals, you know, after a while, we were one of those guys that were fortunate in the sense where we were always in Europe um, for sometimes six months straight out. You know, five of us, and I'd be like, I need a room by myself, man, because this is <laughs> this is getting too crazy. But um, uh, I love the opportunity that the opportunities that we had, and then you know, one time we had a we had a show, we had a in store in Vancouver. And in Vancouver, uh, you know, tempers fled and one of the guys punched another guy in the face. And then I was like, all right, we don't, we're brothers, but we don't physically, right. you know, get to that point where we can't, you know, have this conversation. So I sent uh, one of them home. And then halfway through that tour, I said I wanted to go on my own and, and do my own thing. Um, but with the arsonist in tow, like supporting me, kind of yeah. like a method man to Wu-Tang. But they felt that I would forget where I, my foundation of the arsonist. So they, at what I thought was going to be a studio session for me to record my music was actually like a, uh, I'm out the group scenario. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And it's crazy because I created the group. So I could have at at throughout that time say you guys can't run with the name you know this we can just do a legal thing but i also knew we was an underground group like you know what was the 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 true financial value or even trying to hold up my friends because you know i i i knew a couple of them when they were uh punished you know when they were still sleeping at their i was friends with older brothers from 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 you know some of those individuals and had them living in my house and you know i was kind of that guy everybody came to the house that everybody came to so I let everybody go and do their thing. So that second album had zero input from me. So I was not involved in that album at all. So that's, you know, after that, they they definitely just kind of parted ways. When I think of underground uh, as a group, when I think of this underground label, I always think of um, artists that are unbelievably talented and could, if they wanted to, do like the pop song Mm -hmm. to get those hits and make the money but with underground it always feels like there's there's a sense of longevity there um did you go when you started out were you sensing going in for longevity or did you want to make that kind of that pop hit and get you know get your money and kind of run so i I started with tony touch you know tony touch was a very prominent mixtape dj before he became that I was I was already with him. It was Touch and Destroy. That was right. the name of the group. And, um, you know, we were doing the New York clubs, whatever was like the cool stuff to be at, we were doing it. And when I say we, he would DJ, I would be on the, the mic getting the crowd hyped throughout the night. Um, and then we, you know, I seen him going through, he had a lot of sacrifices in regards to with myself and him being a group. We were only able to put together nine songs in like five years of our relationship and then the arsonist was you know one year we made a hundred songs you know so he gave me an ultimatum like what are you gonna do you're gonna go with them or you're gonna roll with me and when I was given that ultimatum I didn't like it I didn't like that somebody was kind of like telling me Mm -hmm. you know and I'm in the control of my own destiny you know so I said I'm gonna go with my friends you know even though they're 
none of them were at Tony Touch's status, I still felt these guys came to my house, slept in my right. house. They, you know, they were really grounded. So what we made, we didn't, we didn't uh, know what was gonna happen with it. You know, Bobito ends up playing it. Uh, actually, Tony Touch even gets it on Hot 97, and we go up against Jay Z, The Roots, and you know, it was a good run. Um, as far as like us, the longevity of it, we knew that our, well, I knew that our play was stage. I know that's where we were good at. You know, musically, we didn't have a we didn't have a premiere. We didn't have an Evil D. We didn't have a, a Damon Dash. We had no kind of senior mentor to be like, hey, guys, do it like this. You know, so that's why the album has, in my opinion, too many songs, which was 21 songs. And, um, you know, it came out the way it came out. But what's amazing is that, in turn, people loved it. And people like, there is no in-between with that album. It's either you really loved it or you just didn't even right. mess with it. You know what I mean? So that's why... Um, I think to, to, to your point, like when you go more commercial, you'll have those kind of wishy-washy fans. But for us, we had like real core who understood the culture, who understood the value of fat beats, rock steady anniversaries, you know, stuff like that. Um, in an interview prior to the release of yours, one of your solo albums, more than beats and rhymes, mm -hmm. uh, you said, quote, I'm an open cat. I'm not an MC. And I don't rap. I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. Kind of looking at your body of <clears throat> work, what, what make them for you personally works of art versus a work of an MC or just a rapper? So I came, I, I you know, we are, we have so many influences, so many influences where I think artists can box themselves in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like a DJ at a club now, thinking he has a program director he has to serve to. Right. You know, you just program yourself to have to be like, I have to get tattoos, I have to smoke weed, you know, I have to do all these things that I think that's what an art, uh, a, a quote unquote rapper is. Me, I was fortunate to be inspired from De La Soul to Onyx, you know, um, also in my neighborhood. I come from Bushwick before it was gentrified. So some of the funniest people uh, were from the worst places, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And that's that, that showed me a lot of things that I could also be a lot of things, you know, my... My father was a police officer and my mother ran an underground casino, you know, without my father knowing this. So I had like the both worlds in one household. And then my brother would rob whoever really made a lot of money at my mother's casino. Mm. Um, so I was raised in that. So it wasn't so much that um, I cared about being one thing. I, I, I wrote poems. I I. I, I you know, later on in my career, you know, comedy, I got into that and I started doing so many things that rapping and being an MC almost became restrictive only because of how people looked at it. All right. When you, you, you approach and listening to your body of work and just talking to you now, you, you approach writing as a lyricist mm -hmm. versus a, a rapper. I mean, I think, yeah. what, are, what are the two major differences? Um, unfortunately, we care too much about rapping. Um, we care too much about lyricism, um, where I don't want to get to the, what is it like now, but now it's almost like novelty right. to be dope, yeah. to be a lyricist. Like, yo, you see what Black Thor, yeah. you know, he did. And it's almost like where I'm looking at now, a lot of the, the guys are spending more time on networking and building relationships and less time behind the lyricism of it. Um, as far as for me, I cared about it. I'm a son of Lord Finesse, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a son of Kane, son of all those, all those people. So it was only true to my, my lineage of those before me. Um, earlier I said that, uh, prior to recording, I talked about how I played the arsonist on my, what I called underground hip hop radio show, mm -hmm. you know, and in my college I was, there was a commercial radio aspect of even though it was a college radio station there was push to be more commercial uh -huh. um was there ever a time that you or people you know were kind of quote unquote offended by the term underground mc i mean what does that mean i to was you? i was definitely offended uh later on in my career it was almost like saying that big pun was good for latino rapper right. you know right. where I, where i was like ah that guy's amazing throughout yeah, you know yeah. it doesn't matter so I was, uh, you know, a lot of people, I, I came up in clubs. I came up going to clubs. I became a quote-unquote underground rapper only because of my associations. But I came up in very popular New York City clubs, meaning that I danced. So if Puffy came out with a hit, 
I danced to it. You know, I, I, I wasn't like, oh, you know, I can't deal with that, you know. So and I kind of like to have fun. So if underground made people envision, uh, envision dirty tracks, train tracks in the dark, I wasn't I wasn't about that. I had a portion of my life that was like that. But I also knew that I like to have fun and, and have a blast. It's funny, when I started the Underground Hip Hop show, I thought more about lyricism. And mm-hmm. then you would meet people that would be like, oh, no, Underground is grimy and yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. like that. And so it kind of blew my I was like, oh, Underground's a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, it's a thing where people kind of get these um, kind of themes, yeah. and then they they make it that, you know? Yeah. And, and it just, for me, I, I had a blast in the Underground. You know, I've... I've I've had a lot of fun. I've met a lot of cool people. I've never smoked weed in my life. I never got drunk in those in 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 in, in that era at all. So anything you would think, I was just not that. But I was out there, and I'm still out there. And you know, that's that's what makes things great. You grew up. You mentioned you grew up in Bushwick, Correct. New York. Um, what was it for you, you? And you talked about it a little bit. But what was it like growing up there? And how did that experience think shape you as an artist? Uh, it was amazing. You know, I seen uh, my first murder uh, when I was, when I lost my virginity. I, uh, a, fr- a friend got shot, a police officer. She told me she wanted to console me. And so I met her by a church at 1 a.m. in Williamsburg. And then we talked, we talked, I cried. And then she took me to, uh, to the basement of Moja Projects. And she took my virginity right there. <laughs> Yeah. So, but um, I, I I end up uh, you know all these crazy things in my life from everything I witness. You know, we've done a lot of bad things. You know, I've talked friends off the roofs as they held their babies, and and uh, I I got slices in my wrists. I got slices on my hands and my neck at a church. Um, you know, so life's been in- interesting right. coming up. But I I know that that didn't define me. You right. know, I knew that there was more for me. Hey, I was born there. You don't get to choose, you right. know, how, 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 where, or who's your parents and stuff like that. But I definitely, everything I have now is all by design. How has Bushwick, for people who don't know, how has Bushwick changed? And, and- people do know. People do know. <laughs> I, and I hope people do know. What I want to say is that um, the, the, everyone's, everyone's taking an L. The people who were originally from there and the new, quote-unquote, hipsters that are moving there. Everyone is getting taken advantage of. So, you know, it's now a soulless land. You know, they've taken, obviously, the soul out. Uh, which I believe was the soul. I mean, New York City is where hip hop came, where mm-hmm. salsa came from. A lot of things came from here, but if you kind of, you know, marginalize it all and you know, cookie cutter it all, it's gonna be gone. You know, right. so that's how you have, you know, walls you can punch through. You know, sheetrock now and back then, um, of course, it was it was harder, but you know, it was also made for people who were artists come and become artists you know they didn't have to go oh my god i gotta pay my rent and now i gotta live with 20 people just to split this one rent so yeah bushwick has changed immensely like new york city like san francisco oakland uh la it's definitely has changed um i am just fortunate that i'm a kid of the crack era hmm. was there ever i mean we talked about just getting your wrist sliced you talk about um violence and stuff like that but was there ever going back to the art was there a guy or even a girl that maybe was like the local artist or the local MC that kind of had a big impact on you that no one really know about? Um, no, uh, oddly enough. What happened was uh, I fell in love with hip hop through video music box and the radio. Hmm. I was the kid who, who would go with a VHS tape to school and at lunch I'll play all these hot songs. I was the go-to guy, Stretch and Bob. I had the new Big L that I would play for everyone. I was committed to hip hop. Probably the most committed in all Bushwick. Um, Evil D from Black Moon comes out in 94. I Before he even was that Evil D guy of Black Moon, I was sneaking into Sweet Sixteens by holding speakers for him. And he didn't even know me, but I was just helping him. Right. Um, but and then what happened, there was like a, a guy who rapped, but he rapped like casually, like, like not seriously, right. you know, but he was an older guy. And... Um, I battled him. I freestyle battled him. And he had all these written rhymes, and I had nothing ever written, you know. And I, I was like, wow, you know, this guy is good. And, I was, and then another, the guy who I got stitches for, um, 
he challenged me. He was like, you're not a rapper, bro. If you're a rapper, come here to, tonight. We're going to meet at 8 p.m. You're going to come with a rhyme. I'm going to come with a rhyme. And whoever's rap is better is the one who's a real rapper. I showed up at 8 p.m. He had no rhyme. And that was my first Disco Dave is the dope shit out now. Knock you through the sky like a white cloud. Legit Lord Finesse's flow. You know, and that was uh, that was it. That was the beginning for me. I met Tony Touch. Tony Touch was like, word, you know, you're good at what you do. He put me on a mixtape, uh, number nine. And from there on, me and him, I, I, I gained the confidence. I kind of already had my reputation in the neighborhood. So it just grew from there. Freestyling. Um, going into this interview, I watched a bunch of stuff. You, you know, videos. Mm-hmm. You, were, you were freestyling. You did with Kane. Yep. You did with Search. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't even do it with Chris Rivers, Big yep. Head and Son. Um, what is it about the freestyle that kind of that you enjoy? Uh, what I love not only that is spontaneous, that anything can happen. So I came up from battling. Uh, fact, like in the village, when the village was the village and the cops would clear the streets, that was me in Washington Square Park on the train, always looking for a battle. After Wetlands, after Tramps, New York and Cafe, I'll stand outside and I'll be down a battle. Mm-hmm. That was what was great about freestyling because you're always available for anything that was spontaneous. So if you said something and a guy jumps in and he says something almost snarky, or almost like, whoa, 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 was that at me? You just kill him on, on your opportunity and now it's a thing. But that's what made it amazing, right. you know? Where did the hu- you're obviously very, you're very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, where does that where does the humor aspect come in with your rhymes? So the humor comes from you know Andrew Dice Clay. My mother's a maniac. Um, you know it's it's I just like I said when you see the most vivid shit in your life, you just learn how to turn it into something fun, I guess. Um, and then I just honed in that. A lot of people say, "Yo, you're funny." I started. Uh, I started doing a lot of things just kind of going into that. I loved Pee Wee Herman, you know, Paul Rubens, uh, you know, of course, Eddie and all these comedians and learning Mel Brooks went to my high school. I, I like took pride in that, right. you know what I mean? And and just I came up just kind of loving it and kind of, you know, quietly studying it. And then I became, you know, I started doing I started dabbling and ended up getting a four year scholarship uh, through Amy Poehler. To, to write for her. So I was like, okay, this is a real thing then. How do you transition from, yeah, how do you, I mean, how do you do it? How do you transition from writing, I quote unquote, funny rhymes, mm-hmm. I guess, to writing funny for an actor? So, you know, what it is, is a lot of things is confidence. I tell you, Static Selective released an album that I was on and all of, he asked me to be on it. And um, I'm not a fan of just rhyming to rhyme, you right. know. I, I don't want to rap just because I can rap. I want to rap because I'm, I, I'm inspired to do yeah. it. You know what I mean? So he wanted me to be on his album. I didn't want to be on it, and he was like, "Come on, man, you're my friend. Why wouldn't you get on a?" You know? And I'm and I'm static. Like I, I I'm popular. Like <laughs> why are you not? And. Um, I, he played some songs he wanted me to be featured on, and I didn't want to do nothing with it. I didn't want to talk about anything aggressive. You know, like, it's silly to me now. Like, right. I know the guys who are rhyming. You know, I've seen them with their daughters at Discover right. Chuck E. Cheese or whatever. I'm like, come on, guys. But um, I had a song about me having to to take a shit. You know what I mean? Uh, that was already recorded over one of his beats. And this was originally a song I did back when I was... 17 with Tony Touch. I just re, you know, re-recorded it yeah. over one of his beats and updated the lyrics a little something. And he put it on his album. And I was, I, I laughed. And what's so so funny is that inspired by De La Soul and Prince Paul, I made it a hidden track. I told him make it a hidden track because it's so odd. But also finding a hidden track to my era was like, wow, yeah. I'm telling <laughs> no one. You know what I mean? But and then when people will find it and then they'll tell me, Ah, like I almost felt like, oh, okay, this is a real hip hop head. That's how I kind of like was my own little nugget. But um, to transition to that into to on um, paper, you know, it's it's timing. You know, like I, I'm 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 pretty cool with timing, and my jokes just kind of just come out. And then when I started looking at scenarios, of course, I've been through thousands of of, of great scenarios. Um, just retelling those stories, and then you're looking at something someone writes and you're like, man, how could I, you know, implement 
you know, my my craziness to it. So there was a web series called East Willie B that um, I was I I seen them make a post. It was about Bushwick and it was a comedy. So on Facebook, I was like, how are you guys going to do a web series about Bushwick and comedy and not involve me? You know, I was yeah. like very bold on Instagram like that. So they called me in for a meeting and I didn't care to be on the show. I just wanted to see what it was about. You know what I mean? And then uh, the next week they asked me to come in for an audition. Now I came into the audition and uh, there was a couple of people online auditioning as well. But when I went in, I knew a couple of people there already who knew of me. Okay. So they were like almost like this dude, you got him. <laughs> so that made me very confident. I rewrote the script. And I rememorized it the night before. So I went in with my lines. And I knew that's a disrespect to some directors. You know what I mean? But I also knew that it was a, it was a web series. And it was about Bushwick. So what are you guys paying me? This ain't no Will Smith production, you know? <laughs> One time I did a, I did a short film where, where I kissed a girl. And I told my girlfriend, you know, I just want to let you know, you know, I kissed a girl in this film. And she was like, you kissed a girl. I was like, yeah, you know, that's what actors do. And she's like, yeah, but are you getting with Denzel Washington money? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but th that's just how it is. You just, yeah. you just, I, I am, I'm, uh, I just like to have a blast. I know that there's a thousand reasons you can be upset or disappointed, even if you check on your own timeline. But I just try to be that kind of positivity that people get, get into. I'm going to go all over the place. Go here. for it, please. Um, and I think it's important to to mention that you're from the era that Fat Beats Records was important. You know, it was like an era. Yeah, that yeah, it was significant. Was, yeah. yeah. What was the importance of Fat Beats to your career? Yeah. So Fat Beats was very important because it was definitely like a church. It was a like it was also a museum, but it was a hangout. You know, when we released our first record, Tony Touch gave us. He paid the studio session twelve hundred dollars D and D for our first single on Fondalum, which Bobito released, right? And when we had our when we had our in store for the first single, Tony Touch showed up for his money. He was like, "Yo, when the fuck am I gonna get money?" You know, because he was like, "Yo, this shit is popping. Right. I'm sure you guys are making some money somewhere." And me, I was like, I'm still like his little dude. I was under his wing. You know, he was like an old G to me. And um, hearing him be that way with me, it was almost like, wait, what? You're like, you're my big brother. Right. You shouldn't be. But I understand money is a different situation. It changes relationships. But fortunately for me, there was, you know, a bunch of guys in the arsonist and a manager that he could direct his attention to. So anyway, he gets into a fight, a fist, a, a fist fight with one of the members of the arsonists in front of Fat Beats. And uh, we ended up breaking it up and they, they ended up squashing the beef. But just the significant of Fat Beats because the guy who ends up managing it, uh, Eclipse, mm -hmm. uh, was the when I became OC's hype man for his first album, Time's Up, he was the guy taking me everywhere because he used to work at Wild Pitch. So I had a relationship with him. Right. And then Jab, the owner, his he lived on Morgan, which was in a L train stop that I lived on, on in Bushwick. So we started seeing each other. I, I'd go up there. If there was an album I didn't have, I'd go over there and get it. Um, Q Unique ends up working there. Ill Bill ends up working there. It was super significant because we did a lot of their first, you know, anniversary right. parties, uh, the event we did when Big L died uh, in L.A. was for Fat Beats and Big L died a week before. And there was like a big like, should we do this? You know, because it was Showbiz and AG was on the bill right, as right. well. And so was Big L, but he ends up passing. So we're kind of like in a weird place. But we did the L.A. We did the Atlanta Fat Beats. We went to the, the Amsterdam Fat Beats. It was it was good. Fat Beats was a great thing for the culture. Well, uh, you touched on a little bit but you know obviously like you t yeah you talk about fat beats you talk about you you, you, you hear everyone and it seems their mother mm -hmm. is there at some time you, For know, sure. you, you walk in i remember watching like i think i walked in and, and murders was like freestyling why not uh, with that type of culture and grouping uh was there any collaborations that probably would have never happened that just happened because of the nature of what yeah i'm was? i'm 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 very sure that that is that happened because i got great relationships through fat beats me personally working with someone not because of fat beats like we did a song with jay live that was never released but we ended up putting on the lost in the fire uh, high school. 
Yeah. 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 And then, um, but I knew all those guys. A fat beat. I mean, nonfiction. Yeah. You know, the relationship with Arson is nonfiction. Like I said, Q and Ill Bill worked at Fat Beats. So we were doing a lot of bills together. We were doing, you know, songs. They did the 14 years of rap together. And uh, we did some other stuff that wasn't released. But Fat Beats was a great place uh, where Quest Love told me he loved the session because of how dirty it sounded. Um, you know, Kanye with freestyle there. Everybody, like you just said, it was a great place to be at. Uh, in in your video for your your track, Good, mm -hmm. uh, featuring a Q Unique, right? Um, two things that I know you do is you you have a video of the Rocksteady anniversary, anniversary. and uh, Bushwick. Mm -hmm. uh, why? <coughs> and you, you've obviously touched on Bushwick, but well, why have those two things in your video to represent the music right. that you're doing? Uh, so a backstory. That was a song that Ghostface did. Uh, before before anything for a violinist that I worked with named Mary Benari. So I had a verse on it. So Ghostface ends up not doing anything with the song. So I gave this song to Q Unique, you know? And I gave him the song, the, the, the files to the song. So I didn't know. Right. He goes and he remixes it, and then he puts a, his own verse to it. And I was like, oh, shit, this, you just made a... Song out of nowhere, you know, he actually really did. So I, I commend him for that. And then um, I think I went on Craigslist and I offered somebody $60 to film me mm -hmm. and Q Unique, um, you know, throughout Rocksteady Anniversary. I was just trying to find environments that made sense to the song. Uh, Rocksteady, of course, you know, yeah. it's very culturally close to me. I've been involved since the 16th anniversary and now we're at, what, 41, 41 nice. years. And then um, Bushwick, that was the block I grew up on. So... It made sense for me to take it to those places. Uh, when you think of Rocksteady Crew, you think of, for me, it's they're great because they do a lot for hip-hop culture, but they right. also represent all four elements of the culture. Right. Um, you're, we talked, you're a lyricist, uh, but you're more than that. Um, if you, commercially, what we have is that lyrics or rapping represents hip-hop culture. Mm -hmm. But if you, if money wasn't the object, if money was no object, and it wasn't about commercialization, would there be one element that you would want to be the representative of hip hop culture, whether it be grass? For sure, breaking? I would love it to be b boying, breaking. I Why? think I think breaking is the best thing in the world. Why? Because I know that they're healthy. They're, they they visually are healthy individuals. You know, right. they have to keep their bodies in shape. So visually, that's a healthy image for our culture. And I know that those individuals are very passionate to a point where they are. Ruining their bodies, you know, a lot of them, you know, we're getting older, so a lot of them are getting smarter on how to do moves and stuff. But, you know, the crazy legs, that dude went through a lot of operations, yeah. you know, and um, I know those guys, their commitment is more disciplined than a rapper. I, I know that factually. Um, DJs, uh, we're, we're different from, you know, DJs aren't very... Uh, vocal they don't they don't really say a lot and when they do we kind of get mad at like how arrogant they are you know but a lot of them were you know they studied their craft by themselves in a room you know with turntables with headphones on right. and nobody hearing so i don't think they're they're like that person and mcs are too crazy and then graph artists you know what what some people may not know a lot of graph artists weren't even listening to hip-hop you know they were listening to, to to metal they were listening to rock and there's nothing wrong with that it was just you know hey i love the art i just happen to be in new york right. you know what i mean so you know i i love all those elements but i definitely think the b-boy and b-girl are the strongest of all you talked of uh, crazy legs mm -hmm. uh and you obviously you did a show lunch breaks with him for sure man um, when you had big daddy Kane on right for me I can't rhyme for shit, but for me, I feel like that would be like kind of a an uh, in awe experience. Uh, was that same for you, or what was it like when? Kane so, was so driving there, I was stressed. The reason why was because I know I know that Big Daddy Kane has been interviewed thousands of of times. Right, yeah. So for me to say ask him anything new, I was like, ah, you know, I don't think I can really nail it. Right. You know, I think my thing is comedy in this box with Big Daddy Kane. I thought about De La So when they dissed him. I thought about him fingering Madonna and, and having sex with Naomi Campbell. I think of all these real things that would have been real dope questions, but I'm sure somebody asked yeah. it, you know? So I'm like, man, what can I do with this guy that'll be different? 
And uh, what ends up happening, I kind of like just throw it away and I just live in the moment. You know, when he starts doing um, his his rendition, his verses to Crazy Legs trying to catch beats yeah. on the turntable. It was all a, a crazy, <laughs> it was a zoo. Because you got a B-boy who just started DJing last week, catching records, and a legendary MC right there. And, you know, the Robin Williams of rap, me, just going <laughs> crazy with Big Daddy Kane. But it was a, it was a formula of amazingness, and I, I cherish that moment. Was there a, uh, a guest that you had on lunch breaks that kind of embodied everything you thought hip hop culture should represent? Um, yeah, I mean, several. Of we, I just want to let the people know if you ever hear this, I want to let you know I think we were ahead of the curve. Right. I think we were ahead of the curve with lunch breaks. We don't even have a lot of footage. We don't even ha- we barely have any footage. That was because I knew that was a moment, and I told Legs, "Hey, how can I get that?" So I had to like figure out how to rip it. I streamed, I edited it all by myself. You know, I had to do all that. But we had over a hundred and twenty guests. We did that show. Um, Every, like, er, almost every day, like, every day of the week. We were, and I used to drive to New Jersey to do it. Um, Everybody was amazing, you know, and and I'm not even saying that generically. Like, shit, we had DJ Premier, where Premier played the original version to Ten Crack Commandments, Beats, that J. Rue the Damager was on, and there is no reference to that song. Now, if you go to YouTube, there is where you can hear J. Rue's version of the Ten Crack Commandment with me yelling over it. You know what I mean? Um, But there was a lot of special moments in that, but I think we were definitely ahead of the curve. Uh, I asked you about hip hop culture, and we talked about, um, you know, you talked about breaking being important, but you've also you hosted Scratch Academy, the yeah. DVD. Uh, what's the importance of the DJ for you in the culture? It's amazing. I mean, you know, the DJs. I I was fortunate to to be the executioner's tour MC. We toured with Eminem for six months. We did another Sobe tour with the Cool for another six months, and and the DJs. I've always loved the DJs because, like I said before, they're in their room. They're very focused. They're super disciplined. Um, they spent a lot of money on their vinyl. Um, they spent a lot of time with their vinyl. And to come up with those tricks as, you know, just real turntable is, bro, that's deep. You know what I mean? That's a difference between a, uh, you know, a, a graph artist and a tagger or an MC and a rapper, or, you know, a DJ and a turntable is. And, and you just have all those you know, the division. Some people do it because it's just cool to do it. Some people really f- freaking do it. You know, and those are that's the reason what, what made me so attracted to that, um, you know, that element. Talk about your humor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you did write for comedy, but you also, I mean, watching you and Kane, I was dying laughing. Mm-hmm. Partly because I was like, he's not going to make Kane laugh. And, yeah, and, right. Yeah, and, that was my goal, to and, make Kane laugh. Continue. And he, and he, but he kept on going, which right. is kind of like mm-hmm. incredible to watch. So I want to ask, end this interview with <clears throat> some random ass questions. Go for the it. First thing that comes to mind. Favorite farm animal. Favorite farm animal? Man, I like a lo- I want to punch a horse. Actually, <laughs> it's not in a farm, but a raccoon. I would love to hug a raccoon. I know they're in New York somewhere, and they're not in farms really, but I definitely love to punch a horse. Favorite part of being in a group? Favorite part of being solo? Favorite part of being solo is, uh, actually, I'll tell you what, my, not my least favorite part of being a solo is you have to muster your, your you have to inspire yourself. Uh, being in a group is good because I come from a team environment. Favorite part of voiceover work? Voiceover work, it's so fun. I did, I did a video game for Rockstar Games, and the character I was was a big uh, Mexican gangbanger with, a, with, with tattoos all over his face. And my accents and all everything I did, just to play the game and he, hear my voice to that that body. <laughs> it was he was like a big obese guy, like a kingpin like guy. Um, I love it because it's it's any image that the director or producers can 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 create. You mentioned it, but favorite New York City animal. A favorite New York City animal, squirrel. What? Squirrel. The reason why squirrel, because I know squirrels have seen murders. Squirrels are everywhere. I know have squirrels have seen everything. They are still out here while you're out there doing negative stuff and you don't want people to snitch. If squirrels could talk, a lot of you guys will be in jail. Um, yeah, so squirrels. You know, evidence from Dilate Peoples is a huge squirrel fan too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. Uh, we had a crew called the Squirrel Gang. Yeah. <laughs> Logo and everything. 
Uh, you're probably going to figure, uh, I probably know the answer to this, but best New York City neighborhood. Best New York City neighborhood? Oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say Washington Heights because I grew up there. But. Right. And and I guess I, would, I wouldn't I would say Bushwick. You know, it would only be, it'd be biased because it's me. Um, be. Right. Yeah. But I'll say the village. The village because everybody came there. And you'd see like, where are you from? I'm from the Bronx. Right. And then you see different styles. And, you you know, so I think the Ville back in the, you know, there was a shelter there. I remember the girl who sold drugs. She wanted me to be a boyfriend. She gave me a ring. I, I, I never kissed her. I was like her bitch. It was <laughs> amazing. Uh, favorite sound effect in a hip hop beat. Favorite sound effect in a hip hop beat. I liked all Electro Records clean versions because it seems like whoever the engineer was on the Das Effects, Busta Rhymes, uh, Missy Elliott records, they put so many different sound effects that I almost felt like the clean versions were art in itself. And every CD in my collection is clean. I think because you're a New Yorker, I think New Yorkers do this because I do this. And okay. my wife thinks I'm going to be a crazy old man because uh -huh. I'm already doing it. For sure. But you ever had a moment where someone is an asshole to you but and you thought about it but then you kind of 10 sec five seconds later you realize you're saying it out loud yeah i unfortunately i think i say it out loud first <laughs> you know and uh then my lady would tell me you know your daughter's right here what was <laughs> wrong with you um but i also you know unfortunately we're new yorkers in that way you know but i'm very fortunate that i was able to travel throughout the world and i got to see how other people kind of communicate with each other and i know a lot of the stuff that i learned wasn't necessary right, right, and right. sometimes that shit brings its own energy that you're like wait i didn't expect it to go there but it, you know that's how it is when people when people in the midwest or somewhere else may see a video of a fight and you're like how did it go from there to there you know, that that was just how, and that is how New York is. We, like, fast forward to the end, like, beef. Like, let's get what? You want to fight or just <laughs> swing? You know, that's just how it is. The what is there a go-to record that when you just want to get away that you put in your yeah, um, tape? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I listen to, uh, I actually... I, I I recently went on a long drive and just listened to 80s rock music. You know, actually, um, Stone Temple Pilots have a song called Plush that I love. Um, and there's just a lot of other stuff um, musically that I enjoy. I collect vinyl. So I'm one of those, like, I could listen to a random record that I don't even know who the hell it is. I'll play it. And I'm like, wow, this is so interesting. I could envision it. And um, just, you know, working, working. And, and doing what I do, I almost have to be that, right. you know, because I just finished doing a, a a Major League Baseball event where they were like, hey, could you recommend some songs? And I set up their whole vibe, nice. you know, that night. And then uh, for the NBA, same thing, like, hey, what do you recommend? And all my stuff is clean anyway. So, you know, I've just been, I, 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 I'm, I'm definitely a music guy. What's next for you? Um, next for me, I'll be doing... Uh, an, uh, an event in Vegas that I can't really speak of, but I'll be doing my sixth Super Bowl, um, my 13th uh, NBA All-Star game. Um, I'll be doing the the E, it's called the eSports League, uh, where video games are a thing now, uh, have been a thing, but now they created leagues for each sport. So I'm the host, you nice. know, for, for Twitch as well. Um, but yeah, man, I've been... I've been lucky that and fortunate that I just, you know, I just did the Major League All-Star, uh, Major yeah. League Soccer All-Star game, the first of its kind, where I watched some of the worst um, soccer players in rappers play, you know, Waka Flocka, B.O.B., uh, Young Jock playing against uh, some other, like, you know, one-hit wonder type guys, and it was hilarious, but I loved it, you know, and it, and it was also great for the sport. Are you a soccer fan? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a soccer fan. I'm a everything fan pretty much, but I'm a soccer fan mainly because I think New York uh, Americans are so much on their own shit. They don't understand the power yeah, of yeah. soccer outside of America. So I'm almost like, all right, you guys keep thinking that whatever you're doing is bigger than what's happening right. outside of America. LeBron made how much money? Do you know how much this guy yeah, made? Right, yeah. You know, so it almost becomes a thing where Americans are just so much in their bubble that I just love to kind of kind of be a troll too amongst my own homies you know who thinks you know anything is dope i just like to challenge it uh he's destroyed yes uh, an incredible artist uh-huh uh, been listening to you since 1999 awesome uh thank you so much for joining me in the library you got it man everybody out there unfollow me at instagram <laughs> at i destroy
Thank you so much, man. You got it, my brother.